Good morning. Welcome and thank you for being with us this morning. Um, obviously, these are, uh, are and remain challenging times uh, for our country, for our uh, community, uh, our clients, uh, family and friends. Uh, and this webinar series, if you've been part of it uh, at Miller Johnson, is just uh, one way, a small part that uh, we're trying to chip in uh, to help our clients to identify important issues and uh, provide maybe some practical guidance and solutions as we all manage what seems to be an ever-changing uh, legal, uh, political, and um, other social landscape. Um, this morning, um, my partner, my partner and friend, Trip Vanderwall, who's part of the Employee Benefits Group, uh, are, are going to talk to you a little bit about layoff issues. Uh, my name's Keith Eastland, and if you haven't worked with me, I, I work in the uh, Labor and Employment Group, uh, and I've been with Miller Johnson for 15 years. Um, and so we're going to tag team some common questions on uh, layoff issues. I mean, if you just step back and look at the facts here, uh, we just got the news this week that the big three uh, were closing their factories. Uh, the um, uh, one employee tested positive at a, at a plant uh, for coronavirus, and then, then through negotiations with the UAW, they decided to close, shut down production. That's going to have significant ripple effects, obviously. Uh, we're all aware of um, Governor Whitmer's um, executive order that uh, essentially closes down all restaurants and bars for in, um, uh, in on-site uh, service, obviously takeout still available. And you may have seen last night, uh, 40 million uh, residents in California are now under a shelter in place order. Um, further, New York, uh, we just uh, learned last night, uh, has put a work restriction or a work mandate uh, if you are not in what is listed as an essential business under the New York executive order, uh, you can only have 75% of your workforce. So they look at the payroll. If you have 75, you have to, um, I'm sorry, you can only have 25% misspoke. Uh, so 75% of your workforce cannot be in the office or at the plant, whatever your work site location is. So in New York, that means only 25 of percent of your workforce can be there to run your uh, health care facility, well, not your health care facility, your, your facility, your plant, because uh, those would be exempt. Uh, anyway, so long story short is um, layoffs are on the minds of all of our clients, um, and they may be an, an inevitable um, consequence of what's happening in the world. Uh, and also unemployment. Uh, I heard on the news this morning on the drive-in that last month there were 281,000 jobless claims uh, last month. Next month, they are projecting across the country to have 2.25 million unemployment claims, job loss claims. That's more than 10 times um, the amount, and it's likely going to increase as more and more states consider shelter in place and work restrictions on non-essential businesses. So we're first going to talk about the Warren Act, and we're going to talk about the Federal Act. Uh, there is no Michigan Warren Act, so it, it's just the compliance with federal law if, you, if you're in Michigan and you have facilities in Michigan. If you operate facilities or plants or offices outside of Michigan, you need to check your specific state to make sure that there aren't additional state law Warren Act uh, requirements. We call those mini Warren Acts, uh, so we can help you through those as well. Um, and then we're also going to talk about unemployment issues, uh, and then my partner Tripp is going to talk about some employee benefit issues um, relating to uh, benefits during um, layoffs and uh, some creative solutions maybe on how you can address that or if you choose to pay your workers uh, while they're laid off, um, maybe some strategies there. Okay. The Warren Act um, applies to employers with 100 or more full-time employees. So that's the first question that, that we have to look at is, are our clients covered by 
the WARN Act. And so that's going to exclude your uh, part-time employees. That would be anyone that worked on average less than 20 hours a week or any employee that was hired within the last six months. If you're in the WARN Act world, uh, you've got a number of triggering events that you have to look at uh, in terms of whether you have to give the 60-day advance notice uh, and the notices have to be given to the employees or the union if it's a represented facility, uh, as well as a number of other governmental agencies. And we can uh, get into the specific details if you think this applies to you. But uh, so we're looking at plant closing and mass layoffs. Those are the kind of the two main triggers. And plant closing would be a permanent or temporary shutdown of a single site of employment if the shutdown results in an employment loss of 50 or more employees. Okay, so just a couple of points there. So if you're gonna close a plant, a single site of employment, it's not just a plant though. It can be a facility, it can be a, a division within a plant. So if you're closing an entire segment of your business, then we wanna make sure that we take a close look at the WARN Act and its regulations to see if it applies uh, to what you have planned if, if, if unfortunately you have to shut down or frankly if, the, if you have to shut down because one of these executive orders. Um, and, and I will say the last I heard from uh, Lansing was last night and the governor had said that, that it was not on the table for a shelter in place order. Uh, in Michigan. That was as of last night. I know there have been rumors floating around about a 72-hour uh, notice that that was coming. Uh, at least as of last night, Governor Whitner, uh, Whitmer had said that that was not on the table. I'm not sure what we could expect from the federal level, but I haven't heard anything eminent on a federal level there. So, but, so back to the plant closing piece. So you got to look at, you know, single sites of employment. Uh, within your organization to see if it applies to you. Okay. And the other way you could trigger a WARN Act notice is if you have mass layoffs. So what we're talking about here is a reduction in force that's not a, not, not a plant closing, and it impacts at least 50 people and one-third of your active workforce. So those go together. It has to, so if, you, if you're going to lay off 50 people, and it's going to be one third of your workforce, that would be a mass layoff. Alternatively, if you're going to lay off 500 or more, that would also be a mass layoff. So even if you're going to continue some operations, but you're going to meet one of those two, then you would have WARN Act notice requirements. The key component of this uh, is what is an employment loss, right? We talk about layoffs, that's kind of a general phrase. To, to cover lots of different things. In the WARN Act context, when we talk about layoffs, what we really want to focus on is, is the layoff or the termination an employment loss? And there are three ways you can have employment loss. That's, hey, employment termination. We're letting you go. We don't expect to call you back. This is not a two-week uh, layoff. This is not a two-week, maybe three, maybe one uh, month layoff. This is you are done. Um, second is a layoff that will exceed six months or that you reasonably anticipate will exceed six months. And I think a lot of our clients are struggling with that issue right now because I think most people are saying, hey, wait, this is not likely going to last six months, and it's certainly not intended to. Um, and I think that's probably right. I think most folks that we see are – uh, looking at laying people off, they're going to do it for two weeks or three weeks or a month, maybe an indefinite period, uh, but no one that I talk to is expecting necessarily that this will be six months. Now, that might be different for your particular industry, your particular business circumstances, uh, depending on what's going on. And the third way is if you reduce your employees' hours for more than 50% for six months, okay? So, it's similar to the layoff number two, but it's, you know, it's a reduction in hours. So if you're going to, you know, instead of laying people off, say, okay, we're going to reduce everybody's hours, everyone's going to work half time. And when you do that for those employees, if you expect that to last for more than six months, or it actually lasts for more than six months, then those would become employment losses such that 
now you're into the mass layoff or plant closing definition and application. Okay. So that's kind of the refresher or uh, r quick rundown on the WARN Act. Um, and, and as you see in the last bullet, once it's triggered, once one of these um, mass layoff or plant closing is triggered, um, you have to give 60 days notice if possible or as much notice as practical under certain legal exceptions. So the good news is, sorry, um, there's an unforeseeable business circumstance exception. Uh, my partners, Miller Johnson, we are confident that this falls within that exception. But remember, if you're going to rely on that set exception, so you, you've done your number crunching, you've done your analysis, you think you have a warrant event, then um, we can't give 60 days because we've got to do this next week, Keith. Well, you can rely on this unforeseen business exception. Um, but what the law does say is you still have to take reasonable actions to give as much notice as is practicable. So if you want to lay off people beginning you know, next Friday um, or, or in two days or whatever, you want to give, if you can give a day's notice, if you can give two days notice, then you want to get the WARN notices out. So that's kind of the rundown of WARN. Let me tell you kind of three um, um, I guess common client issues or paths, I'll, I like to call them paths, right, that, that we're counseling clients on. First is, do your planned closings or layoffs trigger war notice requirements right now? Okay. And when I'm talking about layoffs, I'm talking about a reduction, those, those employment losses, right? Hey, we're, we're letting people go. The employment relationship has ended. It's going to be a layoff anticipated uh, you're not coming to work, or it's a 50% reduction, right? So if you just have people teleworking or working from home, just because you put them out of your workplace, does not, that's not going to that's not going to factor into the warrant analysis because they're still employed. It's got to be one of those three employment losses. So the first path is: Do we have it now? Are we planning closings or layoffs in the next few days, weeks that will trigger warn? And if so, you got to get the notices out. So that's, that's pretty much just a compliance path. Um, number two, okay, well, we expect to lay off, you know, 20 people. It might be 30 people. It might be 50 people by the end of the month, depending on what happens. So we're not at the 50, you know, amount on the one third yet. Uh, we also don't expect these layoffs to be more than six months. So they're not employment losses, Keith. So, um, what can I do? Can, can, can I monitor it and then give the warn notice? And the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, as long as we can establish that there was no reasonable basis to think that these layoffs, um, and they can't be terminations, but the uh, layoffs or the terminations weren't um, you know, covered employment losses. And we track that. And you have to track it um, the regulations require a, a rolling 90 day period of tracking. So it's very important to, you know, if we're going to go down the second path, we don't want to give the warn notice. Now we want to track it. We're going to do 15 layoffs, you know, next week. And then we're going to do maybe 20 the following week. Well, all of those layoffs are going to get aggregated for purposes of warn notice in a rolling 90 day period. So you have to actively kind of monitor this to make sure that, Hey, once we hit the WARN threshold, we've got to give the WARN notices. Okay. The other thing here that if you take that path to is you have to think about, well, what happens if this gets a lot worse? And, 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 and let's hope and pray it doesn't. But if it does, and these layoffs do have to go to, to six months, um, how much notice is reasonably practicable then? Well, someone may second guess your, you know, your decision. And, and what the regulations and the commentary on the regulations suggest is, look, you get to make that decision from, you know, based on your reasonable commercial judgment. So you as the employer get to say, okay, I now know, you know, based on, you know, the, this contract drying up, this supplier shutting down, you know, whatever my revenue streams are. I have now reports and forecasts that show that, yeah, this is going to be a lot worse. At that point, then you have to give notice. Well, 
if you don't, if you do this and you wait too long, it is possible that someone, a plaintiff's lawyer, right, you know, a year from now, once we get through this mess, says, I think that employer X, you know, they laid off 500 people and they did it over, you know, three or four months. I think that they should have known once President Trump did X that this was going to be longer. And so you might have a legal fight about whether you gave notice as, re as soon as reasonably practicable. Okay. Which leads to the third path, which is, hey, given the fluid, unpredictable nature of what's going on here, should we just give or can we just give the WARN Act notices and just cut off the risk? If you think that you may hit the WARN Act threshold, it may be a good idea to do this because it will protect you. Um, and then you just give the notice. Uh, I know we have some clients that have made this decision to do it. And so if, you know, we're going to start layoffs next week. We just give the WARN notice and say, we, you know, we don't think this necessarily we have to give WARN notice, but we're doing it in an abundance of caution. The law permits that. In fact, it encourages it. And so we've given the notice and we're good. And then you got to give additional notices as you move forward with additional layoffs and or updates. And, and it, it does add a, a, a fairly significant administrative burden if you continue to push these people out in terms of uh, when you think that uh, the layoffs will come. Um, the third path also has real practical implications, right? I mean, what message are you sending to your workforce, to your employees? I mean, everybody kind of thinks that this is going to last two, maybe three weeks, right? People may be hoping that they can still go on spring break. I know I'd like to. But if you send a warn notice, what's the employee going to think? Well, wait a second. This is way more serious. That's a practical consideration. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just say, hey, I get it. But when in, in my experience, when an employee reads, hey, I'm giving a formal notice that you may not have a job, and what's a WARN Act notice, and they Google it, um, they're going to read, well, this, this is for, you know, terminations, and does this mean I'm, I, I'm not coming back? And, and you can manage that. Um, so that's kind of a balancing between a practical and, and legal risk and how much tolerance you want to take. I do think option two is a viable and very legally defensible position. You can manage that as well. It just requires some bird dogging uh, to make sure that you don't hit the warrant thresholds or as soon as it looks like you're going to, you get the notices out. Um, that is WARN. Any questions on WARN? I see there was one. Hey, if it, uh, Go ahead, Trip. You have I was going to say, Keith, I saw one came in. I'll, I'll just read it off for you and kick it off to you. Mm -hmm. Is If an employer pays employees while they are sent home, does WARN still apply? No, WARN would not apply to that person. The question is whether that person would suffer an employment loss. And the answer is they would only suffer an employment loss if you sent them home and work from home and you cut their hours by 50%. Then you might that then they might count toward that 50 threshold. Yep, that's a good question. Um, and I think we lo looks like we have um, one, more one more came question in. That's a, yep, I see a good it. one. Yep. Is, what is what is the potential claim an employee could make? against an employer. I, I would assume yeah. if that's, they failed to, to provide the proper notice. A excellent question, and I apologize. I should have explained what, what's, the, what, what's the legal risk here, right? So the legal risk is that you will have to pay um, the pay and benefits for the notice period uh, for all affected employees. So if you laid off 500 employees and you didn't give them more notice, then you would owe them the pay and benefits for the period which you should have given notice. So the maximum would be 60 days worth of pay and benefits. Now, that's, unlike, that's, that's not likely the exposure, the potential risk exposure here, because we certainly do have unforeseen business circumstances. Now that we know them, about them, right, and this is why some clients are choosing path three, um, because if you give the warn notice, um, you're going to fight about how long you should have given the notice, right? So 
if you if you should have given the notice two weeks before, it'll be 14 days worth of pay and benefits, right? So that's that's the remedy, and and it usually comes in a in a lawsuit. Uh, that's uh, and typically an employee or uh, will get a plaintiff's lawyer and file an individual a claim on behalf of all affected employees, and so that's typically how it comes up. Uh, looks like a couple other questions here. Um, you want me to read them off to you again, or do you just want to select the ones? Yeah, let's see. If we cut hours by more than 45%, uh, would they still qualify for Michigan? We'll get to that. That's an unemployment question. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Here's a question. Um, if an employee works on average 60 hours per week, would the 50% be calculated at 30 or 20? It would be calculated at 30 because it's their actual hours worked. Um, there's another one. If I have 10 employees, most are part-time. Does Warren, does Warren Act apply to me? I'm sorry. Say that again, Tripp. I'm sorry. I have I have 10 employees. Most are part-time. Does the Warren Act apply to me? No, it, it would not. Well, you, you have to be at 100 uh, full-time employees. Any exemptions from the Warren Act as far as nonprofits, like governmentals, employers? Uh, yes, and I can go through those uh, separately, but yes, there are exceptions. Um, okay. Yep, yep, I'm happy to talk with that that person offline. I don't want to get too far in the weeds. Um, so these are all great questions. In the interest of time, um, I'm going to move on to some of the unemployment matters, and I know we have some additional questions at the end. And, and my plan for this is I will um, – once we finish up, I'll go through the, the, some of the questions we received in advance of the um, webinar, as well as I'll stay on the line and continue to answer questions. But I want to make sure that we get through the content uh, in, in an hour here, so, and to be respectful of everyone's time because I know um, how much you all have on your plates. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about um, unemployment issues. So everybody likely saw that uh, the governor issued Executive Order 2020-10. This was an expansion of eligibility for unemployment. Okay, and a couple of major things that this does, uh, it basically says, look, uh, we're going to extend unemployment benefits uh, to workers that have an unanticipated family care responsibility, uh, child care due to school closures, you know, daycare closed, uh, my wife, my, you know, parents become ill, right? If, if that's a reason I cannot work, that is going to be a covered reason for eligible uh, unemployment benefits in Michigan. Uh, same thing if I actually get sick or I get quarantined by a local health uh, official. Um, and so if, if I can't be on some sort of paid leave, then what the state of Michigan is saying, well, then you're going to be eligible for unemployment. Uh, and then obviously any first responders, public health community workers, you know, medical professionals who become ill or quarantined due to their exposure to uh, COVID-19 would also be eligible for unemployment. Uh, so this, this is good. It also increases um, the total weeks from 20 to 26 um, and allows people to apply for unemployment uh, within 28 days rather than 14 days. So it used to be you'd have to file an unemployment claim within 14 days. The governor has expanded that to 28 days, and all of this is supposed to be online. And good news for employers is any benefits that employees get for um, the, 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 any unemployment benefits that they receive uh, because of this executive order or, or an executive order requiring them to close or limit their operations, so what we saw with the bars and restaurants, um, that's not going to be charged to your unemployment account. So that's not going to affect your experience rating or your ultimate tax. So that is one positive thing uh, for employers. Look, if, if we're going to have these additional layoffs because of the executive order shutting down restaurants and bars and other things, that's not going to count against employers for unemployment purposes. 
Um, at, let's see, we talked about, oh, changes to the voluntary quit rule. The other thing that this executive order does is basically says, look, if you don't come to work um, because uh, you're self-quarantining uh, or you, you feel like there's some COVID-19 related reasons, that's not going to be considered a voluntary quit. And so if someone says, you know, hey, I think I've been exposed, I don't want to come to work, um, they're going to be eligible for unemployment. And if you challenge that, you can't challenge that on the basis that, hey, that's a voluntary quit. That doesn't count. Under this executive order, that is going to be something that um, employees are going to have much more flexibility to do. Now, it could be a fact question, of, of course, as to whether this is truly that. Uh, but uh, and hopefully that's not the case in, the, in these times. So um, those are the key components of the executive uh, order. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, layoff versus termination, and layoff termination versus temporary leave. And, and some of this is going to touch on the recently passed um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That's the federal legislation that uh, added uh, paid sick uh, leave up to uh, 14 days uh, for um, employers with five, well, fewer than 500 uh, employees, as well as an, is an expansion of Family Medical Leave Act, which provides uh, opportunity for employees to take uh, FMLA leave for um, reasons related to child care, um, you know, school closures, and they're unable to work. They need to leave for uh, COVID-19 reasons. We are going to have a webinar on Monday that goes into the, the details of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. I'm happy to stick around afterwards and answer any questions that people have today, but I would encourage you if you want to get into the nitty gritty detail on that um, to attend Monday's webinar, uh, friend and partner Jeff Frazier will be doing that one. Um, but what some of you may have seen in your email is the state of Michigan recently sent out, I think it was on Wednesday, uh, a alert or a statement update telling employers, hey, we don't want you to lay off your employees um, with, in light of all of these difficult times. We would prefer that you just put them on temporary leave. Okay. And that's the state of Michigan's position. And, and there's a I can send it to anybody that would like to see a copy of it. They're basically saying, don't commit to rehiring them. Tell them we expect it to be a, a, a temporary leave of 120 days or, or, or less. And the reason that they're doing that is they, the state is saying, look, it's unclear to us whether an employee who is laid off or let go or, or you know, not at work at all before this federal law takes effect. And by the way, the federal law takes effect. This is an important date, April 2nd. So if an employee is laid off before April 2nd, the state has concerns that they won't be eligible for any paid sick time that would apply to them had they been laid off or, or been employed on April 2nd when the federal law, the new federal law takes effect. And so what the state of Michigan is telling em employers is, hey, put them on a temporary leave. We will still make them eligible for unemployment benefits if they're on a temporary leave. And that way they can make sure that they get any benefits that they might be entitled to under the Family uh, First Coronavirus Response Act. So why that distinction matters? Well, I think it matters in many ways, but the two principal ones are first, if you're a strapped cash business, if, if, if you're on the edge, if this is in, you know, important to you and, and you're looking at this saying, I can't afford to pay you know, for this 14 days of additional sick leave for um, folks under this new federal law, especially when everything's drying up and I need to shut down, well, it creates an incentive in that case, uh, rightly or wrongly, for employers to say, you know what, I, 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 if I lay people off before April 2nd, then arguably I, I may have not have to pay them the um, sick pay time, and that's good because that, that would hurt my cash flow. And although there's some tax credits on the back end 
uh, quarterly tax credits that I could apply for to cover any payments I make under that uh, federal law for the new paid sick time, um, I'm not going to get that for a long time. And I, that's going to destroy um, our ability to survive. So that's one reason it matters. So I think that factors into employers' uh, decisions. The other reason it matters is if you're the type of employer that says, we, we want to make sure we maximize all of our um, pay and benefits for employees in this tough time, right? We want to send that message. We want to make sure that people understand that they're valued, and, and we want to partner with them and make sure we get through this. Well, in that case, then you, you should consider putting them on temporary leave because that preserves their un, uh, ability to argue, um, and I think – it's right that if they are laid off before this federal law takes effect, I don't think they're entitled to the um, um, to the sick pay. Uh, just the way the, the, the law reads, and, and again, Jeff will get into the details on Monday of that. But so that's a big decision, and uh, and so if, if if you're looking at that and you're saying, well, we don't want our employees to lose out under this new federal law, then temporary leave is something to consider. So. Okay. Those are us on unemployment issues. The other thing I just practically I want to touch on on unemployment is um, from an employee expectation uh, perspective. Remember that when an employee files for unemployment, uh, they need to do it by the, the Friday, uh, the following Friday after the week in which they're let go. So if they're let go on, you know, Thursday, they have until the following Friday to certify for benefits. And once they certify for benefits, it will take about two, maybe three weeks before they start to get benefits. So nothing in the executive order changes how quickly this will be processed. And in fact, my guess is it may be closer to the three week time period because they're gonna be inundated with claims. So make sure employees understand that any unemployment benefits would, you know, may, there may be some delay there. Uh, the other thing to remember is if you choose to pay your people while they're on layoff, um, they may still be eligible for unemployment benefits, but they have to report any payments that they make, uh, that they receive in each week of unemployment. So if they're entitled to 26 weeks of unemployment and they receive pay in a week, and if it's more than one and a half times um, the uh, 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 the maximum benefit amount, by the way, which is $362. So that's what we're talking about for a weekly benefit maximum uh, that, that employees would be uh, able to receive for the 26 weeks. So $362. If they make more than one and a half times that in any given week, that's going to reduce their benefit. And so they may, if you're going to pay them, they may not want to file an unemployment claim until later because each week gets used up. So if they, if, if you pay them, and they file unemployment, they get 26 weeks from the time of filing. Well, if weeks one and two, you pay them, now 24 of those weeks, they're not getting any money from the state. So if there's a way to delay it, um, you know, to that 28 day, because that's the nice thing about the expansion under the uh, governor's executive order. So, so that's another component to think about uh, when you're communicating with your employees, if you want to make sure that they don't, um, you know, uh, lose out on some benefits. So those are some points. Let's see. Um, I'm just going to scroll through and see if there are any additional questions I want to talk about for the whole group with respect to WARN or unemployment issues. And then I'm going to turn it over to Tripp uh, to talk uh, about some of the benefit issues. Let's see here. question was, are you seeing a pickup in the number of employers that are selecting option three on the WARN, path three? I don't know that we've seen a pickup. I think we've seen about, I've seen about two or three clients just deciding that um, we are going to give WARN uh, notice just to be safe. Um, so I don't know that we've seen a ton. I should add, too, that's a great question because 
I check the warrant notices daily, and there have been zero warrant notices filed in the state of Michigan um, that relate to the coronavirus as of this morning. So it's not like a ton of employers are doing it, but I also think some employers are just saying, you know, and it depends on your business too, right? If this looks like it may have, you know, rolling impact and we're going to hit the 50 and the one third, and this is going to be a Warren event, uh, that's a judgment call um, that, that you have. Um, the Warren Act, is it 100 by location? It is 100 um, by employer, so not by location. So if you have 100 employees um, for the employer, uh, that'll apply. Now, the, the, I should say that the job, the, the job, the employment loss, the mass layoff, the plant closings, those are all single site of employment analyses, right? So just because you're covered by Warren, that doesn't mean you look at all your plants or all your facilities. You look at each one individually. Um, okay. Um, question on uh, unemployment. So the no charge benefits for reimbursing employers. So if you are reimbursing employers, and that's not most private employers, it's usually either a public agency or uh, some exceptions. Um, if it's not chargeable to your account, then the state should be uh, refunding that. That's my understanding of how that executive order is going to work. Um, So the question here is if we lay off employees without being mandated by the state, uh, are we still on the hook for paying unemployment benefits? So um, yes, you would be. So if you choose to voluntarily or not voluntary, if you choose to lay people off um, and you're not mandated, then those benefits would be charged to you just like they would. And so if you're a reimbursing employer, it would be your ordinary uh, charge. And if you're a, um, a, a non-reimbursing, which means you pay your unemployment tax, that, that would affect your experience rating. It's only if you're laying people off pursuant to the uh, executive order on the shutdown. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Trip uh, now so we can keep moving through our, our presentation. And then, like I said, I'll come back uh, to a bunch of questions that we received, some great questions at the end that I think will be important for the group. And then uh, we'll try to uh, answer the rest of the questions you have. All right, Tripp, are you ready? I am. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, this is Tripp Vanderwell. I'm, I'm a member of the firm's Employee Benefit and Executive Pre uh, Compensation Practice Group. Um, and we have seen a number of, or an uptick, uptick of a number in a number of unique employee benefit issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and probably number one on the list, at least lately, is um, what happens to employees' uh, health and welfare benefits um, if they are furloughed, laid off, placed on leave of absence. You know, in the context of changing our employees uh, classifications um, and I guess this comes down to kind of three issues which I've presented on the slide but um, just to give you a little bit of a background here is most health and welfare benefit plans uh, while they whether they be fully insured or self-funded um, have some type of actively at work requirement or continuously working requirement meaning that if I am furloughing my employees or putting them on leave of absence uh, they may not be satisfying that actively at work requirement. So uh, let's begin by kind of walking through, I think, the three uh, classifications that um, I seem to get the most questions about. And the first one is probably the easiest. I've got a number, and that is I've got a number of employees who are now working from home. Uh, are they eligible to continue health and welfare benefits? Um, and in that situation, since they are still working from home, maybe uh, somewhat on a reduced basis because of, of uh, just issues with not being able to be on the work site. Uh, it's our interpretation that 
those folks are probably still meeting that actively at work requirement. Uh, they're still being paid, uh, and therefore their benefits would be continued while they're working at home. Uh, the second classification I think is a little bit more different, difficult uh, of analysis, and that's um, I have an employee, or I'm putting my employees on furlough, or I'm putting them on some type of leave of absence, whether it be paid or unpaid. Um, are they eligible to continue health and welfare benefits? And my response to that is, is you need to pull out uh, the certificates of coverage that you get from carriers um, or your SPD and plan documents and look for eligibility terms uh, with respect to employees who are placed on uh, employer-approved leaves of absence. Um, many of these plans uh, allow for continuation of coverage uh, in the event of employer approved leave of absence, uh, but only for a certain period of time. Um, so if your eligibility terms uh, provide for that, then I would say that these employees are eligible to continue their health and welfare benefits during the leave of absence, whether you classify that as a furlough, an employer approved leave of absence, um, or whatnot, um, at least for that time frame. If you don't have any provisions or you have provisions that do not provide for continuation um, of employer-approved leave absence, uh, then the answer is uh, no. These individuals are probably not eligible to continue their health and welfare benefits uh, during this furlough period, uh, and they need to be terminated uh, as they would in any other ordinary circumstance. Um, and this will likely trigger a COBRA obligation. Uh, meaning since their their termination or their their health and welfare benefit plans are terminating uh, because of a reduction in hours, um, that is a COBRA qualifying event, and we need to send out COBRA notices uh, and provide individuals with the opportunity to elect COBRA under our plans. Um, and so if you are in this situation where your health plan does not provide for coverage during a leave of absence, um, and you want to provide coverage, uh, I think you have a couple options here. Uh, one is to go to the carrier of the applicable health and welfare benefit plan, um, or if you're a self-funded stop-loss carrier, and see if you can modify your plan uh, to provide coverage during these leaves of absence periods. Um, it is our understanding that most carriers in this regard, because of uh, the extraordinary circumstances that we are in, uh, are being fairly flexible and will allow employers to add uh, coverage during leaves of absence, um, at least for some period of time. Um, so if that is of interest to you, and I think that gets back to my first bullet point on the slide about what is your desire, do you have the desire to do that, uh, you may be able to modify your plans uh, to provide coverage for these individuals uh, during these leaves of absence. Um, secondly, if, if that is not an option, but you still want to provide uh, coverage or help to these individuals during these leave periods, um, like I said, the loss of coverage probably triggers, or is likely to trigger a COBRA obligation. Uh, another option would be you could you could basically get to the same result as, as a, continue, a continuation of coverage uh, by providing a subsidized COBRA arrangement. Uh, in other words, you provide the necessary COBRA notices and for your employees that elect COBRA, uh, you are going to subsidize a portion of their premium so that the amount that they are paying for the COBRA premium, at least for a certain period of time, is the same, period, is the same amount as they would have paid as an active employee. That's another option. Now, let me point out with that option, um, if you are not intending to subsidize the COBRA premium for the entire length of COBRA or potentially the entire layoff period, you should know that when the subsidy ceases, uh, that is not necessarily an event that will allow um, an employee to go to the exchange and buy coverage outside of the annual open enrollment period. Um, so, for example, if we are going to provide uh, one month of subsidized COBRA coverage and employers end up having to be off for two months, um, during the second month they will have to absorb the full COBRA costs 
or potentially have to absorb the full COBRA cost to continue coverage because they may not be able to go out to the exchange and buy coverage. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, another issue that crops, crops up when, when I have employers ask me about providing coverage during these leaves of absence is, what do, what do I do about employee premiums during this period? What, what can I do? What's, what's the best approach? And um, my advice in this situation is, is generally treat this like you would um, a, a unpaid FMLA leave of absence where you're required to continue coverage. And that is to present your employers with three options. And one is to prepay uh, for the coverage during the leave out of the employee's final pays before the leave begins. Um, the benefit of this, of course, is if they are paying their premiums through a Section 125 plan, it can be paid on a pre-tax basis. Um, the problem is, though, is especially in this uncertain time, we don't know how long the leave is going to last, so how much of the premium uh, should we have them prepay? And also, in light of the employee's uncertainty about how long their leave is going to last, how much money are they going to need to take home uh, to support themselves through that leave. The second option uh, would be to allow them to pay as you go. Uh, and this is much like a COBRA type arrangement where the employer is going to, or the, I'm sorry, the employee is going to mail the employer a check for his or her portion of the premiums um, during the leave. Um, so you will provide information about the amount and due dates of those checks or, or those, of those premium dates and as far as when the employee should mail those to you. Um, in the event that an employee is late in a payment, um, while well, a 30-day grace period like under COBRA is not technically required, uh, we are recommending that employers voluntarily provide it. You know, a drawback of this provision is if you have few office staff that are able to be in your office um, during these leaves, who, who is collecting those checks, um, who's depositing those checks, who's making sure that uh, employees are paying on time, and if they're not, sending them um, some type of notice that says you have 30 days to pay the notice or your coverage is going to terminate. So another practical, uh, that is a practical issue is the, with the pay-as-you-go option. The third is what we call pay when you return, and that is simply the employer is going to front uh, the employee's the employee premiums for them and try to collect that um, over a series, usually over a series of, of a number of payroll periods uh, when the employees return. Of course, administratively, that may be the easiest, but if you are a cash-strapped employer and, and may, you may not be able to afford that option um, as you're looking you know, down the road, especially in light of you don't know how long uh, your employees are going to be um, on leave and your operations are going to be down or at least reduced. The final classification is is a layoff or termination of employment. Um, from a benefit, I've seen a lot of questions pop up: is what you know, what's the difference between a layoff and a termination? From a benefits perspective, there is no quote unquote defined term between the two. Um, so I would resort to. Uh, the employer's employment policies and how the employer is treating it. If you are treating the layoff as a severance of employment, uh, then it is probably a, a termination or severance of employment versus a layoff. In this situation, I think it's clear um, that coverage is going to terminate just like it would in, when an employee was otherwise terminated and COBRA obligations would apply. Now, again, if you were doing this and you would like to ease the burden on some of these these employees who are terminated, uh, like the layoff situation, you could likely subsidize their COBRA for a period of time if you wanted. Um, lastly, uh, I want to on this issue. I want to talk about um, ACA concerns. So, if you are one of these applicable large employers that's subject to what we call the pay or play penalty under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and you use your look. You use the look back measurement period to identify full time employees. Um, what is the consequences if I lay, if I put people employees on a leave of absence or a furlough, but I don't actually terminate their employment, and I decide that I'm not going to continue their coverage? 
Well, as you may know, under the look back measurement period, they, these employees have probably already established themselves uh, as a full time employee based on their previous hours worked. Um, and the fact that you are, are putting them on a layoff or a furlough or even transferring them to part time um, from an ACA perspective is not going to impact that full time status. Um, uh, so if you terminate coverage during the layoff, the transfer to part-time or the furlough, um, you are still obligated to avoid a pay or play penalty um, to offer these folks uh, minimum essential coverage that is both of minimum value and affordable. Uh, while the COBRA offer of coverage that you are going to offer them is minimum value, it is likely not to be affordable unless you provide subsidized coverage. So that's another issue I think we need to think about. Um, when we're deciding what we're going to do with health and welfare benefits um, during the uh, during the span of these layoffs or leaves of absence, um, but again, just to kind of sum everything up in in one simple point. I think as you're going through this um, analysis, to deter, you know, don't make decisions without consulting the eligibility terms of your plan documents, certificates of coverage, or SPD. Um, make sure you check those to determine if and when these folks are going to be eligible for coverage and then decide um, what decisions you want to make from there. Uh, moving on, to, Keith, can you advance to the next slide, please? I'm sorry? Can you move it to the next slide, please? I don't, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to another issue that we have seen crop up quite a bit lately. Um, and an effort for employers to try to provide assistance to employees who are laid off, um, but doing so in a manner that is um, maybe provide some cost savings to employees is, is what we are referring to as supplemental unemployment benefit plans. These are arrangements that have not really been too popular outside of the union context, um, but we are seeing an increasing uh, number of interest or increasing interest in this over the last uh, few days. Um, from a very high level, what these plans are is, is simply uh, they uh, allow an employer to supplement uh, uh, an employee's state unemployment benefits without negatively impacting an individual's eligibility for or uh, amount of state unemployment benefits. So as Keith talked about when he did his unemployment uh, piece of his presentation, if you're paying your employees uh, a certain amount, that may negatively impact whether they're eligible for state unemployment benefits or at least the amount that they can receive. Many states exempt from those requirements a supplemental unemployment benefit plan. Um, these are ERISA plans, so they are, you know, we have to comply with all of the ERISA requirements, such as the plan document, SPD, Form 5500 requirements. They do need to be set up properly, um, and there are a number of obligations or at least requirements that go into setting these up properly. But if we do so, the idea is uh, if I have to terminate my employees, um, they are likely not going to receive the same amount of take-home pay as they from state under their state unemployment benefits as they would had we continued to pay them. Um, so I am under this supplemental unemployment benefit plan, uh, I am going to pay them additional um, benefits in order to either make them whole so their take home pay is the same as though they continued payment or as at least a percentage of it, whether that be 75%, uh, 65%, just to basically try to minimize the uh, negative effects our employees are experiencing um, based on the difference of take-home pay be, had, they, had they continued to work versus their state unemployment benefits. Um, so what that also does is allows employers to um, continue employees' pay um, at, a, at a rate that is either equivalent to or closer to what they would be taking home had they, had they continued employment with their employer or had the employer continued to pay the employee, um, but to shift some of the wage expense of that arrangement to the state, unemployment, to the state through the unemployment benefits. Um, the other advantage, added advantage to this 
this sub sub plan, supplemental unemployment benefit plan, is that if you properly structure it, which basically means that you tie receipt of of benefits under the sub plan to eligibility in state unemployment for or state unemployment benefits, the payments under the sub plan are exempt from both from FICA for both the employer and employee standpoint. Uh, so this can provide additional cost savings to employers during this time. So if you think it's kind of hard to comprehend this issue in your head, or at least it is for me, but if you think my employee's take-home pay is generally uh, $1,000 um, and I have to subtract out their portion of FICA, which is 7.65%, my employee's actual take-home take pay, their net pay after FICA is $724. So under a sub plan, if, if we structure these properly where they're FICA exempt, um, I can actually put my employee in the same position by paying them $924 because I don't have to subtract uh, their portion of FICA. I also don't have to pay my portion of FICA on this amount either. So that's additional savings. And then finally, if that employee is getting state unemployment benefits, the amount of that benefit or out-of-pocket expense for the employer further goes down. Uh, so if these are properly structured, can provide uh, employees uh, or employers with significant savings and mitigate some of the negative effects that an employee, that employee might otherwise see in their take home pay be compared to what they were earning while they were working compared to what they're earning under state unemployment benefits. Um, to kind of close things out, we are going to do a much deeper dive in these issues uh, with my partner, Jeff Gray, uh, next week during a webinar. I'm not sure if that day has been scheduled, but it is going to be next week. Um, and we're going to address, we'll probably cover some of these topics again, uh, but we're also going to address how employers can use other employee benefit plans um, to ease the financial burdens that employees will be in during these uh, layoff periods, especially if they are unpaid or paid at a reduced rate. Um, with that, I think I'll kick it back over to Keith and, and we'll figure out how to answer a few more questions here. Great, great. Thanks, Tripp. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, I think uh, one, uh, one follow-up issue and it will yet to be determined, I think that that supplemental unemployment benefit uh, plan is, seems like a great plan uh, in terms of some savings for employers that want to pay their employees. I think uh, considering how that matches up with, um, uh, you know, employers' obligations under this new federal law to maybe pay people to be on uh, leave and, and how that all works in terms of, because in that case, they're getting uh, tax refund credits down the line. So um, if, if you're interested in that, uh, I do think uh, that's a, a great opportunity at some savings if you're interested in paying your people uh, you can do it in the in a way that's best for your business and I would encourage you to reach out to trip or tune in next week uh, when they get into the deeper dive I'm gonna go through I got go can, uh, can I grab a couple questions that just popped in that, that yeah I, you bet go ahead trip so I got one that says can you confirm that a terminated employee cannot go to the marketplace once they're enrolled in Cobra uh, that is that is correct. Um, if you are enrolled in COBRA, um, you cannot purchase uh, coverage through the marketplace, at least until the next open enrollment period, um, or COBRA terminates after the maximum COBRA period. Um, I also have a question. Does this apply in all states, um, particularly Georgia? And I think that uh, that's a great question. I think that relates to the subplan about whether subpayments will negatively impact uh, state unemployment benefits. Uh, I can't tell you that it, I, I'm not sure about Georgia. I know that it does in a number of states. Michigan is one. Uh, I believe Illinois is another one. We are looking through this. California is another one. The one that sticks out in my mind that may be a problem is actually Ohio. Um, I did get another question said, can I just do that example again? Um, I'll try to quick do it again and maybe a little bit more clear. So let's, again, say that an employee's normal take gross pay is $1,000 a week, um, and, I, and after I take out their portion of FICA, they're making about $924 a week. If my goal here is to basically make the employee whole so that they are not 
uh, seeing any negative impact in their take-home pay, now under a sub plan, I'm going to have to start by paying them $924 a week rather than 1000 So that's you know, a $75 uh, savings right there. And then you add on your 7.65%. Now we have $150 of savings right there. Um, then you layer in the piece, let's say in Michigan, you get 362. So you're subtracting out. Now your payment to make them whole has gone down to $700. So you've picked up maybe another 250 or $300 um, in that arrangement. So now I think we're up to, you You have basically saved around $500 in this example, and your employee is still realizing between the sub plan and their state unemployment benefits the same take-home pay as they would have um, if they otherwise continued employment or you had paid them at 100% the rate. Um, I do get employers some questions, do we have to bring them fully up to 100% of their take-home pay? Um, the answer is no. You could go down to 75% or, or 70%, um, which would add additional savings to the employer, um, but the employee would, um, obviously, their take-home pay, comparatively speaking, would go down, uh, but n would not go down as much as it would if we simply sent them to state unemployment. Um, with that, I'll kind of kick it back over to you, Keith, and then maybe if we have some time, I can loop back around and answer some other ones. Great, great. Thank you, Tripp. Um, so it's 9 o'clock. Um, I'm going to go through a, a couple of the questions that we got that were submitted in advance that I think are uh, ones that a lot of the audience uh, may be interested in. And then uh, once I do that, uh, Tripp and I will stick around for a few minutes and uh, try to answer a few uh, more questions. Uh, and then again, a lot of this is complicated. A, long, a lot of this depends on specific facts and circumstances, and we would encourage you after the webinar, you know, reach out to your Miller Johnson attorney, reach out to me or Trip, and, and we'll, we'll get you the answers uh, for your specific situation and, and get you the advice you need. And if you're in a position where you think you might have Warren Act notices that are coming and are coming quick, um, make sure to get a hold of us quickly so that we can help you through that. A um, couple questions. First question was uh, related to understanding the appropriate response if an employee is laid off and then turns around and claims uh, paid sick time under the new federal law. I think I answered that, but just to be clear, uh, and the details will be covered next uh, week Monday, if they are already laid off, our best interpretation, and this could change because there will be DOL regulations interpreting this law, but our firm's best interpretation now is an employee who is already laid off would not be eligible for the um, paid leave or the expanded family medical leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that takes effect April 2nd. Um, second question, could a um, employee file a worker's comp claim if they contract coronavirus through their employment? The answer is yes, they could file a claim. The reality is good luck trying to prove that that was caused or, you know, you, you got the virus at work. I think that would be a significantly difficult burden for any em employee to claim uh, from a workers' comp perspective. Um, third, I, and there are a number of these, I think I saw the questions as we were popping in talking uh, this morning, relates to what happens if you want to reduce your exempt salary staff? Let's say you want to reduce them to 50% time, but you also want to reduce their salary 50%. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, we, this is some guidance that was put out in, unfortunately, uh, 08, 09, when uh, we had uh, some economic problems. But that is permissible. Uh, as long as you pay, the, you still have to meet the weekly salary amount, uh, which I think is 692 maybe. I can't remember the exact amount. But as long as you still meet the weekly salary basis and amount tests, obviously the duties tests aren't changing, you can do that. What you cannot do is flip-flop back and forth, right? It's got to be an intended change that's going to last for a finite period of time. If you're interested in doing that, 
happy to talk with you. I know my partner, Rebecca Strauss, does a lot of this work and has counseled clients on that. And there's a great fact sheet from the Department of Labor on that issue. It's fact sheet number 70 that kind of walks through that. So those are some resources available to you. Um, next question was, does an employer have to offer 10 additional paid days under the new federal law if uh, they um, have uh, Michigan um, paid leave law, if they can just add five days to that? The answer to that question is you must provide for the, the, the additional two weeks of leave for emergency sick leave under the new federal legislation. The employee has the option to take PTO or other forms of paid leave, but an employer may not require the employer to take um, any other form of paid leave. And so the state leave that you guys are all familiar with, I'm sure, uh, the, the paid sick leave law, you can, that, it, 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 the federal leave will be on top of that at the employee's discretion the way the law is worded. Okay. Um, Uh, this was one for you, Tripp. Um, how are employers balancing communicating possible exposure events and HIPAA requirements? Um, that's an interesting question. So I think, first of all, you have to decide, figure out where the health information is coming from because not all health information is protected health information that's covered by HIPAA. So um, to give an example, um, we've gotten a number of questions about what, if I take uh, my employees forehead uh, temperature when they come into the office, is that protected, you know, that's health information, Is does HIPAA apply? Um, in that context, no, um, since the, HIP, the health information is not being uh, provided by or from a, a covered entity like a group health plan or a business associate, it's not protected health information and HIPAA wouldn't apply, but I understand um, other employment laws like the ADA may apply with respect to confidentiality. Um, if we are dealing with information that does come from the health plan um, and that is protected health information, um, then whether we can use or disclose it depends on what the purpose is. If you have been contacted by a public health authority uh, requesting that information, um, HIPAA does allow you to disclose that information um, to the health um, public health authority in that situation actually requires you to. Um, so that is not a breach of any HIPAA, HIPAA confidentiality or privacy uh, obligations, um, but is an event that requires you to document that disclosure should the individual ever request for what we call an accounting uh, for disclosures of my protected health information, that would have to be documented on there. Um, I got another que question is, if you are on supplemental unemployment benefit, are you still eligible for benefits? Um, I'm guessing that means uh, employer provided health and welfare benefits. I would say generally no outside of COBRA because um, one of the requirements for sub benefit pl sub plans is that you actually have an involuntary termination of employment. Uh, so we cannot play supplemental un unemployment benefit plans. Uh, to employees that we have just furloughed, put on a leave of absence, or dropped um, their hours of service, um, or or dropped to part time. Great, great. And then I'm going to finish up here um, with just a couple questions on a, a, a relatively hot issue that I've had some uh, client calls on, and that is taking temperature at the workplace. Uh, if you haven't seen it, um, there is um, some helpful guidance from the EEOC that came out on March 18th. Uh, the EEOC's position has been if you want to, uh, you know, thermoscan or take temperatures of employees entering a plant or entering a facility, that was a ADA-covered medical inquiry, and you know you had to, it had to be uh, consistent uh, with uh, business necessity. Um, and, and, and we've got good guidance that says now that you can do that uh, if you'd like to do that, and then you're supposed to keep that information uh, confidential. Uh, and so that is good news on that front. If you are doing that, um, you make sure that you do not 
put that uh, information in a uh, employment file, you obviously want to keep it in a confidential medical um, file there. I will say, again, the caveat is you got to check each specific state. If you're operating in California, despite the federal EEOC guidance, the state of California, despite being in uh, lockdown and having uh, hot spots for uh, COVID-19, they are telling employers you still cannot do that because of state constitutional privacy right issues. And so just make sure that uh, you, you check if you've got plants in specific states, check with your your counsel to make sure that, that, that you're good. But, it, but the good news is in most states, uh, this is not an issue and you can do it. And if it's one more opportunity to, um, you know, assess and to, to make sure that your workers and your workplace remain safe and frankly protect anyone that might be exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, I think with that, it's 10 after. Uh, we're going to wrap up the formal part of this. Uh, Trip, do you want to stick around maybe um, and we can answer a few of these questions for another five minutes and then I think we're going to have to end it. I, I unfortunately have uh, some other uh, meetings I have to attend, but I have about five minutes. Uh, do, you, do you as well, Trip? Yeah, I can stay around five minutes. Okay, great. Um, how do you want to do um, this? you want me to, to, to kick it off or you want, you have a couple more you want to yeah, answer? Yeah, go, go ahead, Tripp. If, if you had a chance to look at some of the questions that came in, if you want to answer some, that'd be great, and then I'll do the same. Um, if an employee stated that they have a family member with C-19, could we request proof from the doctor or does that violate HIPAA? Um, you can request proof, um, but I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure that this is a HIPAA issue I, I you can ask for proof of that without violating hipaa um the, i'm not sure the doctor would provide it keith maybe you want to weigh on this of whether this is a type of ada or, or gina violation uh no i i think i think you you can um trying to Let's see. Um, I'll, I'll take one of these, Trip. Um, your post on the Families First Act does not list the full pay versus two-third pay on the Emergency Pay Act. Is that still in play? The answer is yes. The uh, federal uh, legislation that provides the emergency sick leave, that's for eligible employees, that's going to be two weeks at full pay. And then on the FMLA expansion, if you're taking FMLA leave for one of the permitted reasons under the new law, the first 10 days, you do not have to pay employees for that leave. But after 10 days under the FMLA expansion, you pay it at two thirds of their pay. Uh, I got another one. If you reduce hours leave layoff, how does that factor into the look back measurement um, method for the following year? Um, how do we determine eligibility after the stability period? Um, so this goes back to that ACA pay or play penalty. Um, if you are putting employees on an unpaid furlough or unpaid leave of absence, um, in the current stability period, they are going to maintain their current status as either a full-time or non-full-time employee unless their, their ter employment is actually terminated. Um, with respect to the current measurement period, which you're counting hours for the next stability period, uh, they are not earning any hours of service, um, and if this were, for example, uh, unfortunately to go a, a longer period of time, this could mean that in the following stability period, uh, these folks would not be full-time and would not be eligible for coverage in the following year or the following stability period. Um, so if that becomes an issue, we may want to address um, how we do that if we voluntarily offer coverage even though they haven't hit um, likely the 1,560 hour requirement um, in the current measurement period because of an unpaid furlough. Um, if you pay for a employee's one month of premium COBRA, the employee loses their opportunity to enroll in the marketplace for open enrollment. Um, let me clarify, that was my example. Let me clarify that if an employer if an employee loses an employer's subsidy for COBRA, um, that is not going to trigger a special enrollment event outside of the marketplace annual open enrollment period that will allow them to enroll. 
Um, but the one month was probably a bad example because an individual has 60 days after their loss of coverage from an employer to actually enroll in the marketplace. So to give you an ex a better example, and I hope this doesn't happen, let's say that we lay off an employee, we offer them COBRA, and we subsidize that for three months. And in the fourth month, if they want to continue COBRA, they have to pay the full rate. Um, in that event, um, that would be outside of that 60-day special enrollment window from when they lost their employer coverage, and they would not necessarily be able to enroll uh, in, the, in the coverage to the marketplace until the open enrollment period, which doesn't mm -hmm. begin until November with coverage taking effect January 1, 2021. I've got a, a, this question that looks like a, a few times from a few different participants, and then and, and I want to be clear uh, about this. Um, and the question is this, since the, the new Federal Families First Act um, would give, you know, the full pay for these uh, employees rather than unemployment, should we do a temporary leave for the rest of March so that they can then file for unemployment and then put them on sick leave when the April 2nd law takes effect. Uh, and yes, that is a strategy, and I think that's the one the state of Michigan is suggesting employers engage in, right, is look, don't do a layoff, just put them on a temporary leave, then you can theoretically reinstate them and put them back on sick leave. So then the question there is, are they an employee who needs leave as of April 2nd when the law takes effect? And so if you want to maximize that, what you don't want to do is have the employment relationship ended or have a person be already on leave for a layoff. Um, and, and so if you want to do that, there's ways to do that. And uh, uh, it, that's, in, that, that's one way to do it. So. Well, Keith, it looks like 915. Are, are we to the okay. end or are we going to do a few more? Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to end up uh, today. Uh, we do uh, apologize. We know there are a lot of questions, um, and these webinars are interesting because we can't see you face-to-face, -face, and we're trying to answer as many questions as we can. We're trying to get the information out. If there's something uh, that you feel like you want answered, give us a call. Give your Miller-Johnson lawyer a call, and, and we'll get them answered. Again, you know, it, it's just – impossible to answer all of these in, in an hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, but we will get answers to you if, 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 if these are pressing matters. Just shoot us an email or give us a call, and, and we'll make sure to get you what you need. Uh, again, we, th we thank you for being here uh, this morning. Uh, I would encourage you uh, to t tune in Monday for the, the, the deep dive on the new federal legislation where Jeff Frazier will talk about many, uh, many of these same strategies and, and, and several other issues. Uh, we'll continue to update you with our um, daily end of the day uh, alert updates on any new developments, uh, in, including uh, from a business perspective, from an employment perspective, and any litigation issues that arise. Um, with that, uh, I'm all set, uh, Trip. and uh, as, uh, someone told me um, last night, I thought this was a good line, uh, it, it's been a long year this week, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking the same thing out there. Um, we appreciate um, and value your um, relationships and the partnerships we have with you, and hopefully we can continue to push through this together. Absolutely. Thanks, Keith. And I guess to end in the words of David Boudet, go wash your hands. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone.